Thank you for joining us on RT. The Red Cross and many other experts are saying that the situation in Syria has descended into a civil war, a full-scale civil war. Uh, uh, how, does that, how does that affect the positions of the U.S., the positions of the West, mm -hmm. versus the, 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 the position of uh, other countries? So far, we have seen no indication that either the U.S. or any of the outside actors are taking seriously the consequences of the determination by the International Committee of the Red Cross that this is a full-scale civil war. What it means, among other things, is that the international laws of war, what's known as international humanitarian law, apply throughout the region and it applies to the opposition as well as to the regime. They are obligated under the conditions of international law not to use certain kinds of weapons, not to attack civilians, not to hold prisoners without some kind of process. All of those things are part of international humanitarian law. And we have seen no evidence yet that any of the outside actors are taking any of that seriously. What does that mean to the Syrian uh, conflict? What it means for the Syrian people is that the militarization of this conflict is escalating. That can only be, in my view, dangerous, more dangerous. The notion that there can be a transition, a regime that would not have the same kind of repression that we have seen from Assad all these years, is still possible. The fact that Hillary Clinton is now reduced to acknowledging that, that if Assad himself arranges a transition safe haven, whether it's in Moscow, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or somewhere else, that's still possible. Then the question becomes, who is going to be in control if the escalation continues? if the militarization continues, what we will then see is that the post-Assad government will be led by the men with guns. Just like what we saw in Libya, just like what we saw in Somalia and many other... I don't want to make comparisons. Libya is a very different country than Syria. Somalia is a very different country. But the notion that the victors of a political struggle, because this is still a political struggle in Syria, when the victors are those with the guns, that always bodes ill for women, for children, for civilians. Syria is not Libya. Syria has a long history of, of uh, civil society mobilization and organizations. They have many things that was not possible in, in Libya. It's not the same. I don't want to equate them. But the danger is that you will have certain parallels, certain similarities, such as unaccountable militias who will not put themselves under the accountability of a new government. That is a very dangerous reality. And as diplomats have already acknowledged, if there is another bigger explosion in Syria, if the entire Syrian body politic explodes, it will be an explosion, not an implosion, as Libya was. There is the danger, because it is becoming sectarian, because of that sectarian character that is only now becoming dominant in Syria, in a country that was not traditionally a sectarian, divided, religiously divided country, despite the use by the regime of the religious and sectarian divisions uh, to maintain its power, this was not a population that identified primarily by their religious affiliation as Sunni or Shia or Alawite or whatever. It was a possibility that if you were Alawite, you had a better shot at power. But it wasn't the way people defined themselves. The danger, of course, is that with that growing, the sectarianism growing, there is the danger that it will spill over the borders. And uh, by some congressmen and senators' calls to arm the rebels for the U.S. to intervene, don't you think that's just going to make it worse? Any further intervention by further militarization is going to make things worse. The original militarization has made things far more difficult. Further militarization is going to kill more civilians. The choice of the Syrian opposition to take up arms was contested from the beginning by other parts of the Syrian resistance who said that we have a better chance of changing our government, of overthrowing the government by nonviolent methods. So certainly more escalation, whether it's by the U.S. or any other outside power, is going to be very, very dangerous. Experts now say that it, the, the rebels in Syria are very much dominated by Qaeda. There is an interest in the United States, for instance, uh, of downplaying the role of the Islamists, but it's become more apparent that there are Islamist forces. Whether they are al-Qaeda, I think there is certainly not much evidence yet. 
I think that it is very dangerous for outside actors who are not on the ground, who don't necessarily have good sources on the ground, to assume that any Islamist forces, for instance, are part of Al-Qaeda. That's a word that's designed to sow terror in the minds of anybody in the West, anyone in Europe, in the United States, etc. I don't think we know yet. What we do know is that the opposition in Syria is very diverse. There is a part of it that has an Islamist framework. The same is true of all of the, the rebellions that have led to the Arab Spring. We see the Muslim Brotherhood in power now in Egypt. That's not Al-Qaeda. There were people claiming it then. It was not true. We don't know if it's true in Syria. Diplomatically, the efforts, where do you think that's headed, given that the, the, escalate, the, the situation on the, the ground is escalating? The fact that the UN has allowed the, the monitoring mission to remain on the ground for at least another 30 days is the one bit of hope that I see right now. Kofi Annan's team, led by General Mood, the Norwegian general, has begun a political process in which they have been able to use in, in one town, another town, in small areas from the ground up to make possible a kind of diplomatic process of local commanders of the military and local commanders of the opposition forces of the resistance to create small-scale ceasefires in three or four towns. The town of Deir, Deir es Sor is one town in Syria where it's apparently working. If that could be expanded, if that mandate could be shifted from simply monitoring a non-existent national ceasefire to facilitating small-scale local ceasefires that could then spread and move up from the bottom, bringing people with it, rather than trying to impose something from outside, from the top down, which certainly has not worked, that might be the one hope for a diplomatic and less militarized solution. Susan Rice and other foreign diplomats at the UN said that they are willing or they will withdraw the, uh, withdraw the uh, monitors if the situation on the ground is, does not improve. And so far, it's not improving. So is that, is, is that, is that them saying that this is the last time we're expanding this mission? They are saying this is the last time. They said that the last time. They will change based on political realities, not based on the realities on the ground. The realities on the ground are not what is determining U.S. positions, Russian positions, Qatar's positions, Saudi positions, anybody's positions, except for the people of Syria. What the outside powers are doing has virtually nothing to do with what actually is going on on the ground. So what we're seeing play out at the United Nations is a power struggle between the United States and Russia, between NATO and the Gulf states on the one hand and other Arab states on the other. We're seeing a bunch of different uh, battles playing out diplomatically, almost none of which are taking into account the interests of the people of Syria. Where do you think that's headed? Do you think there will be, since uh, Susan Rice, Clinton and other uh, uh, diplomats have talked about uh, intervention outside the UN, do you think that's going to happen? Do you think that's a possibility that the West is looking at? There is already intervention underway. The Western countries have provided the military of Saudi Arabia, the military of Qatar, that's where they buy their weapons from. They buy American weapons. So it is already Western weapons that are going in. It's not coming directly from the U.S., but it is weapons of the West. The danger of that escalating is very serious. The danger of further escalation involving other outside actors is very serious. I don't think the U.S. right now, in an election cycle, I don't think the o Obama administration wants to engage in a direct involvement in an air campaign, for instance, against Syria of the kind they engaged in in Libya. I don't think they want to. Whether what is known in the U.S. as the CNN factor, the political pressure on a president, and in this case on a candidate in the election, based on what people are seeing on their television sets, becomes very important. It's not impossible that even when the regime in power in any country, and in this country when the Obama administration doesn't want to engage directly, if there is enough political pressure, they may give in to that pressure. That's happened before, it could happen again. McCain is trying to exercise that kind of pressure, other congressmen, other senators? There's a number of senators, there's a number of members of Congress, there's calls from the punditry in the mainstream media 
uh, it's, there's a lot of pressure on the Obama administration, not because any of them have a proposal of what would actually work, but simply because they're using this as a stick to hit candidate Obama in the context of the elections. That's very dangerous for the rest of the world. What are the solutions that you think are best now for Syria? And do you think there is still time for dialogue between the government and the uh, opposition? I think there is still time. I think that the time is diminishing. I think that the level of repression from the government has been so horrific. And in response, the opposition, which I support as a principle of the right of people to rise up against a repressive regime, the fact that they are using stronger and stronger military uh, strategies and military tactics makes that kind of discourse, that kind of discussion, that kind of negotiation more difficult, but there is still time. I think the question remains, will the international community help to make that possible? For example, by small scale, community by community, village by village, city by city, negotiating processes at the grassroots, bringing together local commanders with local officials of the, of the military to work out a ceasefire and then a political process. The best thing the international community could do would be to allow the UN to play that role rather than as a fig leaf of international involvement, a fig leaf of multilateralism to cover the unilateral decisions of several different governments.